So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about world maps for campaigns. I think we've all seen maps that are designed with uh, software packages that incorporate a lot of detail and a lot of color, and they're very impressive and beautiful to look at their artworks in and of themselves. And then we, we look at those maps and say to ourselves, oh, we'll show those maps to our players, and they'll become very excited about the idea of having their characters travel to places shown on that map. But I don't think the maps necessarily have to have that level of detail to excite the curiosity of our players and have their you know, who then want to have their characters travel to those places. So let's start off by looking at the Babylonian map of the world. It's one of the oldest world maps. It's uh, annotated in the Akkadian language using the Kinuiform script. And you look at the you know, uh, diagram on the right-hand side where it's a little more clear what's being shown on the clay tablet. Uh, you can see that it incorporates landscape features like mountains, canals, marshes, um, and then the outer ring also shows the sea, uh, but the inner sphere also shows cities, Babylon being spelled out, uh, the other cities like we see here, uh, Ratu, and uh, the, the, we know that those are cities that are associated with the surrounding uh, kingdoms of other areas of power. So it's a relatively small area of what we now know to be the world, but at the time it was the known world. Now we go ahead 1600 years to, or thereabouts, to the sixth or to the eighth century AD, somewhere around 750 AD, and we see that the you know this is the Albi map uh, or Merovingian world map that was uh, found near the French town of Albi in some archives, and we see that not much has changed. Uh, we still got this horseshoe shape with uh, east at the top, the western. Uh, mouth of the Mediterranean Sea at the bottom, but we can recognize a lot of these names. We see you know, Mauritania and Libya and Egypt and Africa. We see Hispania and Gallia and Italia and even uh, the Isle of Britain uh, shown in this map. But then we get up to the top and we see where Babylon and Medea and India are shown, and we know that you know that's not exactly accurate as far as India is concerned, and that. The people at the time knew that that wasn't necessarily an accurate depiction of the lands and exactly where they were, but it was enough to show the orientation of the you know where they were relative to each other, and then in other texts you could get into what was going on in those places. And we'll move ahead to about AD 1300. We'll look at the Hereford world map, which is uh, still a, what they call a TNO plan map. So uh, the T is typically the Mediterranean Sea, then um, the Nile is part of the T, as is the Don River, uh, the Nile being what separates Africa from Asia, the Don River being what separates Europe from Asia, and then of course Europe and Africa are separated by the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, as is typical of these maps, uh, Jerusalem is shown at the very center, but here we can see that uh, India is shown at the very top, which is once again the eastern orientation. Uh, and, you know, even though it's this circular shape, um, there's been an understanding since ancient times that you know, the Earth was probably spherical. It's actually part of a, a Aristotelian theory. Um, but... Uh, they also thought that this was probably, you know, let's say the northern hemisphere, that we were separated by a torrid zone uh, from the southern hemisphere and that humans couldn't survive that area. And so we were sort of stuck, you know, confined to this one hemisphere. So uh, they, you know, but here again, we find places that we can recognize. There's India on the map, there's Hispania, there's, you know, African countries that we recognize, especially Egypt. And now we're going to move back in time uh, for a reason uh, to the first century AD, and we're going to look at the map of Pomponius Mela, geographer of the first century AD. Now, this map shown on the right-hand side it is not a map that was drawn by Pomponius Mela. This is actually a reconstruction from texts uh, that give an account of where he was putting what. Um, and the same can be said for the map on the left-hand side. Uh, it's actually from the, la the very end of the 16th century, I think 1597. And it's a reconstruction of the routes given in a 
the text of the paraplu of the earth and sea and that's something that we want to drill down on very specifically uh the paraplu of the earth and sea is a merchant's account of uh, his time spent traveling between these different ports and it's something that can be of use to um, game masters in developing these kind of fantasy historical medieval or even earlier worlds so we'll talk about that next so, as I was saying, the uh, paraplu of the Arathian Sea, the Arathian Sea being another name for the Indian Ocean, uh, was something that was recorded by, we believe, a merchant uh, in a Greek language, some of it in High Greek, uh, some of it in sort of a, a, a lay Greek. And it discusses travel between different ports uh, along the route between um, the Mediterranean Sea, the east coast of Africa, the coast of the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Persia, um, and then also along to India and even trade along the Malaysian coast with Han China. And what makes this cool is that the book then starts with uh, an account, an actual text account, again, it's written in Greek, uh, about the people that were encountered, what types of trade goods they had available, and what they were looking to import. And then, because a lot of these names and locations are no longer the same, uh, this particular edition was uh, published in 1912, um, you can find, you know, editions from different eras right up to the to the current. Uh, there are many new copies that you can purchase at a bookstore or online. Uh, and then we'll see these are the historians' interpretations of exactly what is being talked about within the text itself. So, you know, what is the Arathian Sea? Well, you know, here we have it. it's the term applied by the Greek and Roman geographers to the Indian Ocean, more generally in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf as adjuncts it says and so you go through all this and learn about different things that you read in the original text what they might mean what are these distances what what types of goods are these but then the coolest part of the paraplu is here, these few pages here at the end where it's actually just a list of the different trade goods and commodities that were being imported and exported at each of the ports so if you wonder you know what each little town in your campaign world does well you can take from these lists okay i see you know this place might import this and this and that but they also make this and that and the other thing that's available for export and the merchants that are in your world would pick up you know what's going for the export and drop off what's you know being imported in any of those particular locations and this gives you an idea about you know how to distribute those different wares and it's a pretty basic list as you can see well the paraplu doesn't offer much in the way of exchange rates for different types of goods if you're in doubt about what something is you can go back into the middle section the historian's interpretation of the period account now we're going to move ahead to uh this uh economic atlas of the world's commerce uh this is by jg bartholomew and this particular version was published in 1907 and what i, I the reason i recommend this one and i'll put a link to it down in the description of the video is it has a very extensive list of di the different commodities that were going available in the world that were being shipped from port to port now because it's 1907 there are going to be things on here that aren't necessarily appropriate for the medieval or you know bronze or iron age or whatever but the reality is many of these products were in use at that time and this is sort of before some of the the modern conveniences so you know it's it's still fairly old anyway it's like 40 some odd pages where you get you know back to yellow berries and yarns and you know wattle bark watches whatever you go through the whole list and see what you want and then of course this also includes various maps of the world and so you might look at natural vegetation, how that's actually distributed on the earth. Now, these are, you know, over 100 years old at this point, but they're still fairly accurate in terms of, uh, you know, looking at the, the older world. Obviously, things are more built up now, but you're, you're, you're creating a, a fantasy world that's 
more akin to what we've gone you know more than 100 years ago so you know we have temperature patterns wind patterns current patterns uh densities of population all these maps are useful in planning your own world even if that's a different world from earth but now let's move to some modern mapping data and see what we can do with that as far as planning our fantasy campaign worlds. So what we're looking at here is some um, uh, global ecological zones. Uh, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, zones that were provided by the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, the FAO, uh, part of their Forestry Resources Assessment Program. And I've been working on turning in parts of the Picardy region of France into uh, a campaign setting. I want to start by uh, showing the actual mapped terrain from that region of France, but then ultimately want to turn it into a fantasy setting. And I think we'll do that probably in uh, a another video. Uh, not this one. This one will just look at some of the mapping data that went into it and some other things. Uh, so back to our map then. Well, we're, you know, we, we have then these ecological zones for the entire globe and we have a PDF that goes with that to explain it all. So let's just zoom in on, on this region of France. And we see that this is all one particular type. We consult our chart we see this the temperate oceanic forest and we can do an identification of this particular area just to double check yep temperate oceanic forest and we can get a code and everything for that but that's not particularly relevant to what we're doing right now and so we'll go back over here and we'll look up the temperate oceanic forest and we find out things then about the climate and about the geomorphology or physiography of the area, what kinds of landforms we would find there. And importantly, we find things about the vegetation. And, you know, in this particular case, we find that it's dominated by beech forests and that um, there's also in the understory then a uh, kind of holly uh, also we have uh, wavy wire grass and bracken and european blueberry as part of the understory and you know this all goes back to when we're asked what kind of you know forest is it uh, we see that then where there's nutrient poor acidic soils the beech forests are mixed in with uh, a lot of oaks in this case it's english oak and sessile oak and uh, that tells us a little bit more about what we can find and then you know keep going into it we find that we have these beech oak hornbeam associations the carpinius uh, petalus and then we can kind of you know, figure out a few more things that I don't think it gets into it too many animals in this case but that's something that we can drill down on some other ways and of course it's not just that we can also go back to let's say this studies in french forestry from 1920 and uh, i know we're talking about the forest of cousy bass and uh, saint colbin uh, so we can take a look at those pages and find out a little bit more about that from this 1920 guide and we find out here we are department of onion and the uh, around this Mount of Long and then the forests are Cousy Bas and Sankaban Cousy and we see that they are indeed oak beech hornbeam forests with mixed broad leaves uh, parts of the middle middle story and so we've confirmed that in sort of a earlier part of the last century that was the same association that's still showing up on the maps today is the dominant so we're confirming a little bit more about this population. Now let's go to, um, you know, if you happen to live in the United States, whoop, you could actually also look at it in terms of um, the USDA's major land resource areas. And that will offer you a very similar type of description of what's going on in different areas so you go through that and you'll find all these regions and it'll go through for each region 
then what is the physiography or geomorphology, what's in the landscape, what's in the underlying geology, what the climate is like, what's the water situation as far as water resources, uh, what are the soils like, what are the biological resources, and in this case we're, we are going to include both plants and animals, and then it talks a little bit about what the land use in these particular areas is. Now, that's not especially helpful to just look at, you know, one color of map all, you know, divided up into a different area. It doesn't help you. Um, so when you have modern mapping data, you can pull it into a GIS and then do things like categorizing the values according to, in this case, we use the name, set the classification. I know there's no spares, so what I want to do is go down and get this, uh, get rid of this last catch-all category down here. So, okay. Now, this is almost too many categories. Uh, you see, you you really had trouble distinguishing that many different colors. So, if you wanted to use this particular map, you'd actually have to go in and probably you know set up different categories of color for different areas, and then differentiate between different colors that way, or actually just break the map down into potentially just the area that you're interested in, so that there are fewer categories to to look at overall. But in the grand scheme of things, just like everywhere else. You can go into this area with your information button and, you know, get, okay, well, this is the central clay pan area. Then you can go into the booklet and find central clay pan area. Uh, you know, by its different land resource regions or LLRs. Uh, another option that does a very similar thing to, I actually recommend the MLRA from the Natural Resource Conservation Service, part of the USDA. I, I use that in my work all the time, so it's actually very useful. Um, you also have the option, though, of um, something else I use. Uh, this has been updated, uh, but these are. Um, the U.S. ecological region, regions, um, the updates have been done by the EPA, and they maintain the, the literature on it, but you can go back and still find a copy of the uh, first edition, or there's a second edition from 1995, which is just updated, and this added some more categories and that sort of thing. But this will give you kind of the same thing that we saw with the FAO maps, uh, break down into various ecological reasons, and then when you go to that particular part of the, the guide, then it'll tell you more about the climate, the vegetation, types of soils, the fauna that are present. So these are all ways of building up ideas about the different plants and animals and the types of landscapes that might be differentiated on your own fantasy world. And it, just in, as a last, if you're unfamiliar with a lot of like the landscape terminologies and that sort of thing, uh, one of your options is to get this is also from the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Geomorphic Description System, which has a full glossary at the back that will tell you all the definitions of different types of landscape elements, so you can go through that at your leisure. All right, so now we want to take a look at what we can do with some uh, raster elevation data. In this case, we're looking at two different images um, from the shuttle reconnaissance topographic missions and turn them off independently and turn them back on. And so if we wanted to then do a pseudo color by elevation levels where we have green being the lower elevations and orange being the upper elevations in this particular example, we can do so. But unfortunately, what we'll find is that because they're separate images, they don't match up. So what we have here is the lowest part of this particular map is uh, in green here, and then this upper part is in orange there. But it's different for the other map because they're not joined together. So what we want to do then is we'll go back to single band gray very fast, and we'll start again. In this particular case, what we want to do then is kind of join them together, right? So what we'll move into is our raster data section, and then we'll go to miscellaneous, and we'll look to merge these two. We'll have to select them. We've got them both, and then we'll run that, and 
And we have a merged section. So we'll turn these two separate ones off. We see now it's all part of the same image. If we wanted to add in some color then, we would get all one unified picture with the dark greens at the lowest elevation. In this case, we'll have ocean. And then our orange spots at the upper elevations and a sort of cream color in between. And that is much more useful for this whole area. However, we don't necessarily need to use that entire area. We're not perhaps going to make anything out into the ocean, that sort of thing. So what if we wanted just this particular area of northern France, the Haute de France, and uh, we don't want to have all the other sections involved in our map? Well, uh, the other problem we have here is uh, that this is in a geographic coordinate system, WGS 1984, and it's in uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds, and we don't want that. We want uh, some unit of length that will make more sense for our players and characters' travels within this fantasy world. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it out to another uh, projected coordinate system, in this case, um, a universal transverse mercator um, for zone 31 north uh, that's based on the WGS uh, geographic coordinate system. So what we'll do, turn that back off for a minute, is we'll go ahead and um, reproject. So we want to warp or reproject and we're coming from WGS 84. We want to go to WGS 84 UTM zone 31 north. And then we'll go ahead and run that. All right, so now we have an entirely different thing here. So you can see it looks a little bit different. It's now warped out in a different way. And that's because it's uh, a slightly different way. You know, Because the Earth's surface is curved, it is difficult to represent in a two-dimensional map. You have to make some shortcuts somewhere, whether you want to show accurate angles or the right kind of the right amount of area, that sort of thing. Uh, in this case, we're also going up for distance of units, and that. And we'll make that conversion here. So let's say we just want our little area back here again, but how are we going to do that? Well, let's go ahead and clip this raster. And we'll clip it by this particular mask layer. And the mask layer is the Hotsa France region. And we now have it in the same source. And we want to move it, keep it in that particular projected coordinate system. And we're also going to check to make an alpha output band because we want it to conform to just these boundaries. So we run that, turn that off. Now we have just a section of that elevation map that's confined to just the particular area that we want. So I don't want to get too far into the weeds with describing every type of analysis that can be done with the GIS data. Um, what we have here is our now bounded digital elevation model. Uh, the one thing I did want to point out is that because the original data were in meters and I wanted to show my elevations in feet, I went to the raster calculator. And you remember we added a, a second layer that would be the uh, transparent alpha layer. But I'm going to put in the first layer of the original reprojected digital elevation model with uh, the elevation in meters. And then I want to multiply those pixels by 3.281, and that will give me an elevation in feet. Now, I've already done that here, and we can take a look at that. We can go with that you know, elevation is up to 938 feet, and on the bottom end, it's showing is negative 19. Um, there is a little section of the, the ocean or the English Channel up here, but I don't think that's what's going on. I think there's actually probably a void somewhere in the data itself that I can probably go in and repair, but I don't want to get sidetracked with that because what we, what we want to do now is just talk about this particular region 
of the Haute de France. And uh, then within that, I can go ahead and add in a number of things, but one of the places I started was with, I extracted from that elevation data the contours. So now I have the elevation contours and I also got stream data and I got um, an old map that I geo-referenced and we're going to talk about that in this last section here um, where I, I got the points for different towns and then also um, one of the things I did was uh, I went to this population census from 1881 and I looked for the proper commune that I was looking for and we went canton by canton and I wanted to get all the populations for these little villages within the canton of Cusa de Chateau and uh, that's what I added into the map itself. I'll put links to all these things in the description for the video. So I've got um, populations for 1881 that are also showing up in the labels as well as the names of the towns. Um, all these different villages and castles uh, that are going on. And uh, you know, then I've also digitized in the forests. And uh, the stream's actually a layer that I acquired, but I've drawn in some additional streams from um, older maps that I've geo-referenced. All right, so let's talk about some of the reasons why we want to use this elevation data with historical maps. Uh, we'll take a look at this next slide and we see this large castle. Uh, some of you may recognize it as part of the banner on my channel. Uh, that is the Chateau de Cousy. It was built in the 1220s, uh, AD 1220s, by Enguerrand III. And uh, it was at its time uh, the largest castle in France. It was larger than the King's Castle. Uh, that large round tower you see kind of in the middle there was about 180 feet tall. And uh, it actually had enough room to hold 1,500 troops plus the family who owned the castle. And uh, it would hold enough stores for them to last for a year if they were besieged by an enemy force. So here we also have in the middle then uh, a plan map of the castle buildings and uh, the outer tower, the inner bailey, the outer bailey. Uh, that cross shape is actually a church that predates this particular incarnation of the castle that probably goes back to sometime in the middle of the 11th century AD. And then we'll look at the uh, right hand map, which is actually uh, got Lehman Hatchers to show the topography of the hill that's sitting on the top of the hill. The castle is uh, itself situated on what's actually the northwestern prominence of the slope there. And then uh, the inner valley is in the middle, although it's shown as blank there, it would have actually held uh, the barracks and stables for the troops that were actually staffing the castle uh, during times of military need. And then uh, also Angoran III uh, had the town walled off. So there on the bottom and to the right, you see the buildings of the town. Um, it had one very large wall, the Porte de Long, and uh, two smaller gates with single towers uh, on the Chauny Road and the Road to Soissons. And so we'll, you know, what we want to do is we want to take this three-dimensional representation of the chalk hills and the castle sitting on one of the prominences. And you can see it in the bottom left-hand corner there. Um, but you also get an idea for it's covered by forest. It has is drained by numerous streams. And uh, there are other hills in the area at the very upper right hand corner. There is uh, the hill where the larger town of Long was situated. Um, 
during the Middle Ages, it was probably about 3,000 uh, in total population. So that would have been, and, and it's the arrondissement of Lan is the, the administrative area where all of this is taking place. So we're going to go from that three-dimensional scene to a two-dimensional map here, uh, but still got a little you know, three-dimensional representation in the sense that there's contour boundaries and you can look at the elevations marked on, on the actual contour lines. Um, I've you know, labeled some places uh, such as Saint-Gobain, which actually had a, a thriving flat glass and mirror producing industry. And uh, then to the right near the legend there, you can see Crepe en le Mois, and uh, that actually was known for wine production. And then you see that big uh, label down there in the bottom right hand side, that's La Cruz. And uh, that's actually another limestone hill that's uh, known for a, a lot of um, human carved stone dwellings that go back to prehistoric times. However, they were also improved and used by people I into the recent history. Um, so, you know, 1900s. Um, and I think, yeah, actually, there's probably still occupied structures there. I don't think anyone lives in the caves so to speak but um if you think about like some of the big monster hotels that you've seen in modules well here's a place where these things actually exist and there's a number of different so uh there's a cavern system up near saint Cabin, and we're going to look at some of the mines and quarries and so forth uh for the chalk limestone that were in the area that are places that would be like dungeons but the thing that we want to move on to now is what we want to do with this three-dimensional data and here we're looking at uh, what's the google satellite imagery and i've given it some three-dimensionality uh, that you see on the bottom left hand side and uh, pointed towards where the castle is in that picture but you can see that the you know there's still some forest and farmland on that rise uh, that's a one big area of kind of chalk hills and then uh on the upper picture towards the right hand side you can see what i've done is i've taken the two-dimensional uh flat paper map or a digital version of it and i've draped it over that three-dimensional elevation model that we've been working for with the, the one that we converted all the way to elevation in feet and now you can start to see where uh, on the map that town is and the castle is on that hill and this is called uh, georeferencing uh, in, in terms for the paper map to where the you know to an actual place on the face of the earth in three dimensions and then we drape that paper map over that three-dimensional representation and then here's lastly we'll get a little close-up of exactly uh, the contours of that draped map um you can see of course the castle is on the left hand side that's the and the inner belly and the keep and then uh, area nine there that big open space uh, is the outer belly eight is the main gate to the castle and we see on the right hand side uh number six is actually uh the cathedral there in Kusi. And then, of course, the rest of it is the upper town. And I've taken this. Uh, this is not a, a medieval um, skyline image from the town, but it was probably early 19th century or so. Um, you can get an idea of what it would have looked like. Uh, and I think in actuality, you sort of have to flip your perspective. Um, this is from looking for the, the picture makes it looks like you're looking at it from the south side as far as the the flat map, but the landscape perspective is actually from the north side of town. So you're standing on the north side, looking at the north side of uh, Chateau de Cousy and the the town. So I want to just take a moment and give you kind of an idea of when I talk about the quarries and hand-carved limestone cavern systems that are all throughout this area of Chalk Hills. And one of the reasons why I identified this, this particular region as being a great place to turn into uh, a kind of campaign setting, but I want to convert it all the way to a, a fantasy setting instead of having it be the, the real earth. But just look at some of these pictures and I'll, I'll put this link, of course, down in the description section. It gives you an idea of how 
intricate that these carvings were. Look at these altar settings and different things that have been carved into the walls and, and some of the elaborate caverns and corridors and chambers that would go on and on and on. Um, like I said, since I put the link up there, I don't want to, you know, get too far, uh, get too caught up with, you know, just showing that. But I also wanted to take a moment and just give you another perspective on it. Uh, this is coming from a published paper in the Fourth International Symposium on Archaeological Mining History. Um, this is a map of the general region. And so here's the town of Long. And then here is the area we see on the southwestern area down here would be where the Chateau de Cousy is. And then this is kind of a representation of that chalk hill. And you can see it is not the only chalk hill. There's actually pretty extensive coverage of these kind of fine chalks up there. And then uh, lastly, you know, this is a picture of a mine uh, obviously not a dungeon or a cavern but so this is a quarry where they you know went in and excavated this chalk limestone and as you can tell it looks a lot like a dungeon and imagine that it's not just this one set of chambers this one excavated mine but they're all over the place and so in some of the regions, like we, uh, on the map I showed you, Le Prout, um, I mean, there's a number of passages that have been carved in from prehistory to relatively recent mining operations that went into maybe the, you know, the 18th and 19th centuries kind of thing. Okay, so for the last exercise, what we want to do is uh, deal with actually geo-referencing an historical map to modern digital elevation data. Uh, so we have our digital elevation model, which we've bound to our region of interest. We're gonna zoom in here. And of course, this is the big series of chalk hills on which uh, the Chateau de Cousy is located down here on this little northwestern promontory uh, on the southwestern side of the hill. And then we also see over here this little kind of two prong, two axis shape. That's actually the hill on which the town of Lom is situated. And so we have the lightest area up at the top of the hill and a slightly darker area around the sides of the hill. And then down in the bottom, we have the kind of dark flat area around the town itself. So one of the things we do when we're georeferencing a map, we typically use as many ground control points as possible. So these are correspondences between points, known points on the physical map or the electronic map, as the case may be, and the digital elevation model. And there are any number of different types of transfer, uh, transformations that we could use from the very simple, like, uh, you know, just a one to one correspondence between uh, points that we select on the map and points that we select on the digital elevation model or slightly more complicated ones like the Helmert transformation, which will deal with rotating the map if it needs to, to match up uh, the points on the paper map or digital map with points on the digital elevation model. And uh, then all the way up to more complicated things like the thin plate spline, which will warp the map in as many directions as needed to get points that you digitize on the you know, quote paper map and points that you correspond to on the digital elevation model. So this is useful in archaeology. If, for instance, I have an historical map about a, a property that had a number of different outbuildings on it, and you know I, I know where the property markers are from an historical map, and I can match those up to points on the ground in, in real space in the physical world, then I can take that historical map and use the georeferencing of the GIS software to put that quote paper map onto the real face of the earth and help to predict where I want to put in my excavation unit. So uh, I know that I can test a little more intensively in an area that I think had some of those outbuildings as opposed to, you know, areas that I see on the map then were, you know, empty or, you know, being used for another purpose like growing crops, da 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 da. And so, um, what we typically want is a high degree of accuracy and use a lot of ground control points. However, we also have uh, options such as uh, what we're going to use now is the uh, 
freehand georeferencer. Uh, it's a plugin that's available for QGIS. Um, so we're going to open up that plugin and we're going to choose a map. And in this case, we're going to choose uh, the Battle of Long, which was a uh, Napoleonic era battle fought between uh, Napoleon's forces and the Prussian army. And we'll add that map in. And so now we have a map on top, you know, it's, it's in the world of the GIS, but it doesn't match up in terms of uh, scale. So the size of loam here on this little hill should match the size of loam here on the map. So what we're going to do then is just use the scale feature scale feature of the plugin and I'm going to hit the control button while I'm doing this so it will um, rescale the map in two directions both left and right and north and south and then what we want to do is just kind of increase the size of the map or scale of the map until we see that it's about the right size and we'll move it over here to the actual position on the GIS and that seems pretty close east to west. I need to move it a little bit more. But it seems a little long on the north to south axis. So one of the things we can do is kind of bump up the opacity or transparency a little bit so we can see better what's underneath. And I do think that what we'll do is use another one of the tools, which is to adjust the sides. And this will do one side at a time. And I think I'm just going to adjust upwards from the bottom. Make that a little smaller. And now the, the area of loam, the, the town, has shifted a little north as we did that. So the, the center of town kind of thing, the full size is because we changed the shape of it. We're going to go back in and move it into the right position. And that looks pretty good. Good enough for government work, as they say. And we'll turn the transparency back off. And now what we want to do is we want to open up a new 3D map view. And we'll make that a little larger so you can see that. And we have to configure it. So we've got to go in and tell them Tell the computer, tell the GIS that we're no longer using just flat terrain. We want to switch to a digital elevation model. And then we have to choose one. We're going to choose the one that I've, I've modified out to the elevation units and feet. And uh, now you can bump up this vertical scale for greater ver vertical exaggeration, 2, 3, 12 times, whatever you want. Um, you would do something like that if you're in a relatively flat area, but you want to accentuate the minimal changes in elevation in that area. Uh, you could bump up then the usually, you know, three or less is what you're going to use. Um, you could do that so that you make the, the vertical change more obvious. In this particular case, loan is on top of a hill, and we don't really need to fool with it at all. So we'll just use the one-to-one -one, uh, representation of the actual changes in elevation shown on the digital elevation model. Uh, however, we do want to take the skirt up to about 100 map units, in this case 100 feet. That just helps with the visual rendering of it so it looks better. And then we'll say OK. And then we can tilt that and zoom in on our hill. And we see all the armies arrayed around the hill of Long. And more importantly, what we see is that the town basically is shown on top of the hill where it should be. I could actually tighten that up a little bit on the north-hand side. It shouldn't be down the side of the hill like it is there. Uh, but that would just be a matter of doing what we've already done, just go in and, you know, scooch the the sides of it, you know, down from the top a little bit and then maybe move it around a little bit more just to recenter the map on, on the hill. But I, you can get an idea now of how you take, you know, a paper map that came out of this book. It's the Life of Napoleon um, Atlas, Volume 2. I selected the page with the Battle of Lawn in it and just extracted that and, you know, turned it into a PNG to use as a map in, in the GIS. And, you know, just that easily, we have now a three-dimensional map of that historic battle from 1814.
And I think that's probably about it for the demonstration. Uh, if you have any particular questions, of course, feel free to ask them down in the comments section, uh, and we can, you know, get into finer details and all of this stuff um, in future videos. Uh, I do a lot of GIS work for archaeology. It's an important tool for me. And uh, I think it's also something that could be relatively useful if you want to either uh, use real world mapping data for your locations, or if you want to use it to uh, you know, create your own locations out of real world data, which I think is where we want to go with this uh, General Haute de France region, um, that we can turn it into a fantasy setting as opposed to a real world setting. And uh, that's where I'll let it off. Uh, thank you very much uh, for watching, and we hope to see you again at the next one.